So far, most of what we've been focused on has been Europe. And some of y'all have argued that, hey, why is this called World War I? It should be called Europe War I. But in reality, especially because the major European powers had these empires throughout the globe, it really was a world war. The, the most significant fronts were the Western Front and the Eastern Front. But we have many, many, many other fronts, many other campaigns. And a lot of these helped shape the modern world, especially the world of the 20th century. You had fronts, you had fronts in Af campaigns in Africa between the various, the various colonies that the empires had in Africa. You had a front here in the Caucasus between the Ottoman Empire and, and Russia. You had Japan involved. Japan on, in World War I was on the side of the Allies. It wasn't one of the major actors in World War I, but it helped provide naval support. It helped against some of Germany's colonies in the Pacific and in China. But what I, wanna, what I really want to focus on in this video is, is, in some ways, one of the most interesting campaigns, or, or I guess several campaigns, of World War I, because it really helped shape the modern Middle East. And a lot of uh, the way countries are shaped now and a lot of the conflicts that we now see in the Middle East, to some degree, can be tied to what happened leading up to World War I and what happened after World War I. So just as a little bit of context, this entire region right over here, what we consider to be the Middle East now, especially Arabia, was nominally under Ottoman control. Now, the Ottoman Empire had been losing power for centuries leading up to the 20th century. Especially if you look at the Arabian Peninsula, it was it wasn't direct Ottoman control. It was very hard to control the various uh, Arab tribes there. Egypt, by this point, as we enter into World War I, in the late 1800s, the British occupied, start, began to occupy Egypt, essentially took control of Egypt. As we enter into World War I, Egypt is officially a protectorate of the British Empire. So this is Egypt is, for all purposes, it is it is British. And Egypt is of huge strategic interest at this point in time. In fact, it continues to be of huge strategic interest because it has the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal is right over here. It, con it connects. It's a man-made man canal made in 1869 by the French. And it connects the Mediterranean Sea with the Red Sea. And to see its importance, you just have to look at the map at a more global scale. It's the fastest way to get from Europe by ship into the Red Sea and into the Arabian Sea and to India, which was a significant part of the British Empire there, or to go further east, go into the Indian Ocean and go to places further east. So it was of huge, huge, huge strategic interest. And so that lays the groundwork for essentially the various campaigns. Oftentimes, they would be collectively called the Middle East campaigns, or they're separated sometimes as the Sinai and Palestine campaign and the Mesopotamia campaign. Mesopotamia, that's in modern day Iraq. The Sinai Peninsula, that's part of modern day Egypt. Palestine in 1914, that's now been part, it's what, what, is, what was then considered Palestine, is now part of Israel, part of uh, uh, the West Bank, part of the Gaza Strip, uh, part Lebanon. And, and as we'll see, all of these countries that we now recognize as different countries, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, uh, the, uh, Syria, that these, these were all kind of carved and shaped by what happened at the, or during World War I and at the end of World War I. So as we get to the beginning, right at the, right at the outset in 1914, the British land, the British land right over here at, at I guess you could kind of, kind of the so southern end of, of Mesopotamia. And over the course of the war, they just keep driving northward along the Tigris River. So they keep, they keep driving northward and northward and northward. By the end of the war, they've essentially captured what you would consider kind of most of modern day Iraq. And for the most part, it was, it was a very successful campaign for the British, although they did have some significant setbacks. In particular, in particular, at the end of 1915, you had a you have the British who were who were held up it at a in, in Kut, and they were essentially sieged by the Ottoman Empire. 147 days siege. At, at after 147 days, uh, they had to surrender. They were starving in there. They couldn't get supplies. They were dying of sickness. This is actually a picture of a of an Indian soldier 
after the siege of Kut, after they were kind of taken by the Ottomans, after they surrendered. And even though the, Mesopotamia camp, the Mesopotamian campaign was successful for the British, it, the, 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 the siege of Kut is kind of recorded in British military history or global military history as one of the biggest humiliations for the British army, where you had that, you had that many troops who had to surrender. They were starving literally to death. And one thing I should point out, I'm going to be talking about the Allies, the British troops, but in the Middle Eastern campaigns, in the, the Sinai and Pal Palestine, Palestinian campaign, and in the Mesopotamian campaign, Indian troops, which were part of the British Empire, played a significant factor, especially in the Mesopotamian campaign, and so did uh, the Australian and New Zealand troops. So when we talk about British troops, we're also talking about all of the various nationalities that were part of the British Empire. So by 1918, they were able to capture much of what is now modern-day Iraq, or much of, I guess you could say, Mesopotamia. And on the other side of, uh, I guess you could call it, you know, on the Egyptian side of, of the campaign, the first few offenses were the first few offensives were actually taken by the Ottomans. They say, hey, look, the British hold the Suez Canal. If we could take back the Suez Canal, that would be a pretty crippling blow for the British, especially in their ability to get to their the various ports of their empire. And so in 1915, you have the Ottomans try to make an offensive to try to capture the Suez Canal. It's repulsed. It fails. They try again in 1916. That fails again. After that, the British then take the offensive. And once again, it's the British, but we're, we're talking they have Egyptian troops, they have Arab troops. Well, Egyptians are Arabs. They have Australian troops with them. They have Indian troops with them. And they start to make an offensive. And that offensive essentially continues through the course of World War I. So by... So by 1917, so 1915, they make the full, they, they, they are able to defend the Suez Canal. 1916, they defend it again. By 1917, they're making an offensive. They're making an offensive. They're able to, after several, after several tries, they're able to take Gaza in 1917. Then they're able to take Jerusalem, which was kind of a, a, a major source of prestige. Obviously, Jerusalem has a thousands of years history of, of various armies trying to take Jerusalem. But then they continue on. And by as, as, as they saw the, that the end of the war was imminent, especially as we get into 1918, the British were and the Allies were essentially on a land grab because they knew that as soon as an armistice is called, it's, it's kind of your last chance to, to grab more land. And then it goes to the bureaucrats to start negotiating. Negotiating things. So in 1918, the British are essentially on a land grab, or especially the Allies. They take Damascus. They they get all the way, all the way north to to Aleppo. And by the end of 1918, you essentially have the end of the war. You have the an armistice at the end of October with the Ottoman Empire. We know that the Austro-Hungarians signed their armistice in early November, and so do the Germans. And World War One is over. Now, there's a bunch of interesting things here, and you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm kind of doing a very broad survey of these campaigns. One is the famous movie, Lawrence of Arabia. It took place during these campaigns. This is a picture of T.E. Lawrence, who was a, a well, he was, he, was, he was many, many, many things, but he was this interesting character who tried, who, who helped the, the Arabs rise up against the Ottomans, against the Turkish rule. So he was heavily involved in, in helping to coordinate the, Arab, the Arabs' uprising against the Ottomans. So in this case, the Arabs were helping the Allies essentially push the Ottomans, push the Ottomans back. Now, the most interesting thing, the outcome of this, and we'll probably talk into a lot more detail about this in future videos, is because by the end of the war, you have the Allies in control of all of this territory, in control, let me do that in a better color, in control of all of this territory right over here, it was really left to them to carve up the modern Middle East. And it was agreed to ahead of time that the, that the French would gain control of kind of you know, the, what is now Syria and Lebanon. So this is roughly Le Lebanon's right over there. Syria, we're talking roughly, roughly this region, including Damascus. So roughly this region right over here. And it left the British in control of what is now, uh, what is now Israel, Palestine, what is now Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and 
Jordan, and Iraq. And as we'll see as we go into the 1920s, this was all part of the British mandate. They carved it up, and, and, and a lot of their decisions have led to a lot of what we now see as the modern Middle East. And the French essentially were in control up here in Lebanon and Syria as part of the French mandate.